returning again to a, a broader historical context, this might seem like a superficial question. I hope it isn't uh, because I don't think the answer is at all obvious uh, since quite likely for the vast majority of human societies, citizenship hasn't been the norm. But just why ought it to be preserved? Why is it something that is so worth fighting for? What are its most crucial benefits? And why is the dying citizen uh, such a concern? Well, nobody has really been able to explain why it was that this colony in the United States, uh, more so than Canada, more so than Mexico, more so than anywhere in the world, exercised such influence and power that it wasn't commiserate with its size. I mean, it's 6% of the world's population. It's the most powerful country in the history of civilization. If you go back to classical Anicenes, for example, the historian Polybius was asked that question about Rome specifically. And he said it was because of their constitution and the idea of Roman and citizenship. What he meant was that there were checks and balances through a tripartite system, executive, two consuls, tribal councils, and the Roman Senate, and then legates and judicial, tribal um, courts and regular courts. And this, this, sent, this gave a sense of stability in the Republic and allowed people to pursue economic uh, pursuits without uh, coercion from the government, contract, rule of law, and then later the Justinian Law Code. And that was a sequence. Same here with the United States. We have a stable uh, constitutional system and we inculcate the, its principles to the citizens who then were taught how it worked and how they, they had civic rights and responsibilities. And then more importantly, and this is more controversially, that this system was designed, as its critics point out, by upper middle class, if not wealthy white male, uh, Virginia plantation owners, some owning slaves, some not. and. 95% of the non-indigenous population were white males. But what they don't tell you was, unlike the Spanish colonial system where you would not be allowed to immigrate into Mexico or South America unless you were A, Spanish, and B, Catholic, there was no limits on who could come. Anybody could come. And tribalism and human nature being what it is, obviously the nation was British, and then Scottish, and then Irish, and then it started to open up to people from Western Europe, French and Dutch, Dutch early as well, and then Germans, and then Asians, and Eastern Europeans, and Jews. But in each, each iteration, of course, the original population was biased and prejudiced. But the system that they created was inherently contradictory to their own biases. Because no sooner were they trying to exclude people, which sometimes went on for decades, then someone would say, but wait a minute, to quote Martin Luther King Jr., I'm not being a radical, I'm just holding you to your own principles that you created. All men are created and equal. I didn't think it up, you did. And so that, that inherent nature of the United States allowed it to create uh, Americans that had no superficial resemblance culturally, ethnically, racially, to the people who founded the country, but could share the same aspiration. And that's why this country and citizenship were so valuable. And I, I can't see a model anywhere else. The other thing about it was, because everybody was originally an immigrant, and Americanism was an, a way of thinking, and very soon trans, I guess you would say, transmogrified from being an Englishman who became an American to anybody, then it was very elastic and expansive, and you could get enormous numbers of people who were talented, and their race became incidental. With African Americans, it took the longest, and anybody that was the most distant from the original core, because people were birds of a feather, I guess, flocked together, but it the logic was such that people can, and I think they do now, have equal rights with people who look 
exactly like the people who created the system. And that was the intent of the founders. They wouldn't have written that. And that gave the United States enormous advantages, both getting talent and uh, eliminating tribalism or ethnic, I guess, intolerance. And so, and the, and what I mean, I'll, I'll give you one practical example. If you or I want to become a citizen of China, we, we're not going to ever be accepted. If we want to be a citizen of Uganda, we're not going to be accepted. I can tell you, if we go down to Mexico and we ask for Mexican citizenship from the people I talk to, who you'll never be fully accepted as a Mexican. You won't be able to run for office and become the president of Mexico with blonde hair and blue eyes. It's not going to happen. But it will happen in this country that the people who become president or high elected officials may not look anything like Thomas Jefferson or George Washington. And if anybody can think of any other place in the world, maybe the outside of some own place in Europe, I'd be happy to hear about it. And that that's what's so ironic that some of the most fierce critics of this system, they ne never go to the next level and say, America's racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, xenophobic, and it should be like this system. And they never do that. And I, I don't understand that. I've been in every Arab country uh, in the Middle East, I think, every one. And I'm always fascinated when I ask them how such rich countries can be so poor or so unfree. And I'm, I'm always told if I meet a journalist or somebody said, We're, we hire our first cousin. That's how we do it. We fire our first cousin. Our first loyalty is somebody that looks like us. And when we see an American, I said, well, what do you, what do you think of American? We don't know what they look like anymore. We see them in Iraq. We saw them in Afghanistan. We don't know what they look like. So that's very different.